Well, Ron, I, 703, should we kick it off? I'd say that's a great idea. All right. Well, thank you for uh, joining us for our second webinar. Um, I guess I hope everyone's getting their crops in and rain's good and manure is good and everything is good. So I guess without further ado, I guess we'll get this show started. Um, our guest today, uh, we've got Pete Kapuska uh, here with AgriSecure, uh, also an organic farmer. Uh, we've also got James uh, Schroper. He's our in-house agronomist here at Crop Fertility Services. Um, and then we have our two owners, uh, Mark Kesky, uh, also an organic farmer, and Scott Nemoa, uh, organic farmer number two. Uh, finally, to cap things off, we got Don Clements. Uh, he's an organic uh, marketing uh, specialist. And uh, I think uh, we'll give James the floor first. Yeah, and Scott and Mark, you can feel free to, to chime in, uh, Pete, as well, um, as we go along. But one of the things I wanted to touch on, I'm going to share my screen, Ron, here. Okay. Um, just one of the things we wanted to do a short webinar, webinar here today is a lot of guys are going to the field, and I'm always fascinated in the spring. Um, and the number of calls that we get with farmers asking, well, should I do this? Should I not do that? Uh, what do you do on your farm? And I think farmers in general, we forget the uniqueness of our individual farms. Uh, every situation is different. And the value of a good cropping plan. Um, some guys still go to the field shooting from the hip. And I think uh, there's significant dollars left on the table at the end of the year. Just been sufficient planning. So... Just wanted to get everyone thinking on on um, just different aspects of who to look to, what a good cropping plan should look like, what 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 does it all include, and uh, how do you know someone if you're working with someone to come up with a good cropping plan? How do you know that it's something of value and leading in the right direction? So, you know, one of the things we're faced with here in the 21st century is agriculture has gotten way more complex and complicated here in the last 20, 30 years um, with technology, advancements in equipment, plant genetics. Um, you know, when my grandpa went to the field, um, you know, all he had to know was how to hook the horse up to the, to the, uh, to the field cultivator at that time when he started farming. So things have changed quite a bit and gotten more complex and happen at a faster rate. Uh, when we look at the advancements here in the last 10 years, it can be mind boggling. And I can only imagine the next 10 years, uh, we're gonna see robotic tractors and things that people wouldn't have dreamed of. Um, my, my dad's generation wouldn't have even dreamed of when they were even younger. So um, one of the challenges juggling all this information is the farmer can often feel like a, a jack of all trade but a master of none. And um, not that you need expertise or help on every aspect of your business, the farm, but you know whether it be selecting seed genetics or coming up with a fertility plan or a cash flow, a budget, um, sometimes pulling an expert there to give you a second opinion and provide some additional advice can be invaluable on your farm. Um, so some of the things when you, what I wanted to bring up when you're looking for it, because I find farmers are very trusting individuals sometimes. Um, but when you're looking at an individual of who to trust and helping to develop these things, you know, you need to look at their education, where they're coming from. Are they, you know, do they have some background, some college education, um, when it comes to fertility and questions of growing a crop, you know, are they a certified crop advisor? And, and then practical experience, you know, do they bring real world experience to the table as well, or is it just books? And each one of those provides a different avenue of knowledge and each one has their value. And it's really finding somebody that has a little bit of everything there um, gives you a, a well-rounded individual. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on is farmers in general, we're, we're very susceptible to marketing. Uh, there's a whole agricultural sector that's focused on marketing to us specifically. So when we're looking at data and, and information, looking for information, well, how, do I, how do I improve my farm? What can I do better? You know, one of the key areas most farmers aren't aware of, uh, or if they're aware of, they don't spend a lot of time looking at them, but that's research and field trials. And 
partly, you know, here I have an example on this slide of a study, um, uh, mycorrhizae, and most studies are very lengthy, boring, and sometimes you feel like the technical language is, it just it loses you uh, over the course of reading it. So, uh, but when you're looking at for good scientific data, those, whether it be university journals, uh, good farm journals, uh, those magazines provide invaluable because it's, it's based on research and the scientific method. Um, a lot of farmers tend to look at sales information and sales information can have value. Um, I'm not discounting that at all. But I think what's important is when you're looking at that sales information is to make sure it's data generated, data uh, referenced information and not just testimonials. It's very easy for you to be looking at a product or a piece of equipment to come across a testimonial. You always find uh, the same thing for um, elixirs or granny's rheumatism, uh, rheumatism as a medicine. Um, but testimonials have their limitation because they're, they're not actually data driven and it's very subjective. Um, I was in a field one time and, and a uh, fertilizer salesman there and he was talking about the success of his product on this hay field, just how green it was. And um, I looked down and the crop after, you know, this was going on almost three weeks was only about five, six inches tall. And I just couldn't believe how, how ecstatic the, the fertilizer sales and was based upon the fact the crop was green. In my mind, it was, well, it doesn't really matter how green it is. There's nothing here to cut. So it doesn't do the farmer much good. So that's where when we were looking at the, these testimonials, you, you really have to take them with a grain of salt because they're so subjective. What, what is a success story for somebody else? When somebody says it was a great success, what does that actually mean? So um that's one area i think farmers should should really pay attention a little bit more to is you know is this something that's data driven or just something that's subjective um the other thing is farmers often don't think of is uh, what's the cost of not knowing um you know we go to the field we do an operation scott i think this is a you have an excellent example of today of we're out there looking to harrow the corn and you know, the question in your mind is, what's the cost if I don't do this harrow pass today? You know, am I going to be able to make up with an additional pass later on? Or is there something else that will do a better job? And um, what, what what value is it providing to my farm today? And that's a hard number, especially when you're doing a blind weeding pass organically uh, for organic weed control. It's hard to know that. Yes, this is going to pay. But fortunately, Scott got rained out of the field. So we've got a two acre test strip in this field, which didn't get heralded. So we're going to have a very good check, check on whether or not it was a productive pass today of him going across the field. Um, the other thing that, that a farm or farmer doesn't know is okay, if I'm not doing a practice or I don't have an additional piece of equipment, you know, is this costing me in yield? Um, or if I'm fertilizing or putting manure on and I'm just dumping it out there. I may be able to maintain a good yield or even a high yield, but I have a very poor ROI, return on investment. Or I'm looking at a new piece of equipment. Most of us, uh, I know I'm tempted when I go out <clears throat> looking for a piece of equipment to, boy, that looks cool. I really need it on my farm. And then when I go to my wife, she's pretty good about holding me accountable in so far as, do you really need it or do you just want it? And uh, the new paint can be very tempting. So it's good to have data to help you make that decision and put it in the context of my operation. Is this gonna provide the value that I'm gonna pay for it? And am I gonna see an ROI within a short term adding this to my lineup? Um, these are just some good, good graphs showing that, you know, more fertilizer does not mean a better crop or more. Uh, when we look at a traditional soil test, for example, you know, if you're in the high or very high range, the chance of you seeing a response to an additional nutrient application typically is less than 10%. So uh, if you're working with somebody and they don't look at soil test, um, you could be over applying where you don't need it. Uh, or if they're just ignoring what you have out there in your field, you're not taking advantage of the fertility that you have on your own farm. Uh, the other key thing I think when you're working with somebody or on whether it be seed, fertilizer, a uh, piece of equipment is, you know, budget. 
what's the short-term ROI versus the long-term? Uh, I run across this a lot in organics. Um, and even when we talk about the soil health revolution here, and that is, you have a lot of people tell you, well, we, we spent 30 years destroying our, our farms and our fields. It's going to take a long term, you know, for us to re, re, revitalize them. And that's, it's true, it is going to be a process, but if you don't make it in the short term, you won't be there in the long term. So it's good to think long term, but you have to keep it in context with your cash flow situation. And then when you start looking at different practices on your farm or different crops, alternative crops, you know, I think it's important for a farm farmer to take into consideration the risk management, you know, can my farm afford to take, you know, a hit on a crop that let's say is an insurable with crop insurance uh, or setting up a sequence of crop rotation that, you know, with a cover crop integrated that would, you know, risk potentially a crop insurance payment or risk potentially the crop, um, you know, interceding in corn earlier maybe I get more cover crop growth, but then it puts my primary crop more at risk. Can I afford to take that risk? Am I in a position to do so? Um, the other thing a good, good professional should bring to your farm is, uh, you know, the tools of the trade. Uh, basic tools, I just wanted to bring up soil and manure testing. And I'm surprised how often farmers will tell me, well, I don't soil test, it's so expensive. Uh, it's not worth doing. Um, and I just wanted to throw an example out there. You know, you're looking at 40 acres. You're at least going to do a composite sample off of those 40 acres. Well, you should be able to get that done for, let's say, roughly $180 for the sample and the test results. Well, if you're doing that once every three years, that's $1.50 a year. And my question to the farmer would be, how much fertilizer can you buy for $1.50? Or how much crop loss can you afford to take for $1.50 a year? And uh, same thing for manure. A guy, an example, this spring was spreading 72 acres. And I said, you know, we should check, make sure that manure that was delivered to you, it has the nutrient load that we're anticipating. Well, sampling is expensive. Well, that $50 on 72 acres comes to 70 cents an acre. If you're short 20, 30 pounds of nitrogen and you're 15, 20 bushels of corn short this fall, you're gonna be out a lot more than $70, 70 cents an acre. You know, other things that we now can use in the field, tissue testing integrated with yield maps, NDVI maps, um, there's a lot of tools. And as a farmer, that's all additional information we can use to make better decisions on the farm. And uh, I, I'd like to bring up who would go to open heart surgery with no examination with your doctor. You know, you just walk into his office and say, doc, you know, I think I got a heart problem, just dig in. So it's good to use these tools so we can make better management decisions. Uh, and that ties very closely in with record keeping then. It's one thing to gather the information, but if we don't put it in a format that we can use and integrate into our, into our operation to come up with a good farm plan, the information becomes what I call useless data. Uh, I see a lot of yield information is ultimately ends up, you know, printed out and on somebody's binder on their desk and they, they never look at it. They never look to see what, you know, what was my yield across those fields? What, where are my inconsistencies? Where are my problem areas? And why do I have those problem areas? So just getting information in your fingers, if you don't, if you're not able to analyze them or make use of them, doesn't actually provide any value to your farm. And that's kind of all I had um, bring up today. Just wanted guys to uh, think about some of those things and you know, what value can that bring to, to your operation? And maybe Pete or Mark or Scott, uh, you could just provide an example of, um, you know, how, how that, any, any one of those aspects help you, helps you make, a, make better decisions on your farm. I would say uh, record keeping is um, pretty important. Um, just knowing, I mean, you can have yield maps, but the records behind that. Mark, I mean, you may be on mute. Oh, I can hear. I can hear Mark. Oh. Okay, I would say record keeping is uh, pretty important. Um, just having the records there, and if you do a good record keeping, you can actually, you know, if somebody oh, comes on. I think on you're your... still on mute, Mark. <clears throat> so I was going to have Pete then uh, talk about AgriSecure. Um, Okay, uh, can I 
get the screen shared? Um, yeah, you uh, you should be able to on the bottom there. Uh, okay. Okay, is everybody able to see my uh, smiling face there? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you for uh, joining us this evening. Um, my name is Pete Kapuska. I'm an account executive with AgriSecure. I'm also a farmer. Uh, I grew up on a farm outside of uh, Fort Dodge, Iowa, uh, family farm. Um, after my Iowa State education, I use that word loosely, I uh, went back to the family farm and farmed uh, from 87, uh, 85 actually, because I was still in college till 1992. Got out and I've been working in agriculture and the retail side of things, uh, co-ops with seed companies, insurance companies, adjuvant nutritional companies. And I've been with AgriSecure now close to three years. Uh, last year with COVID and there was an opportunity out there, actually got back into farming. And I think it's important to state that there's no perfect way to do farming. And so I consider myself like uh, so many lawyers do practicing lawyers. I'm a practicing organic farmer and I'm going into my uh, second crop year. So as I go into the second crop year, and I think most farmers who are on the call tonight are organic farmers. Um, you may have your own record keeping system, maybe very similar to what your dad had is miss, maybe this platter is similar to what you're currently using. Although I doubt most farmers are currently using this platter. The reason I bring this up is that most people, their record keeping system is somewhat antiquated. And while this planter will plant corn, and I'm sure your record keeping system works to get you certified, otherwise you wouldn't be organic. There's probably better ways out there. And your better way may be a, a 30 year old planter that does have an air delivery system, uh, very functional. Um, it gets the job done. Uh, but when you think about planting, there's um, a return on that investment that is pretty easy when you're running the combine to see how good of a job you did planting. Are the seed space right? Uh, did you get the right population that you were shooting for? And so I think right now, most farmers think they need to be at a higher level in their machinery purchases to make sure they're getting the most out of their yield. And I would say, given the fact that in organics, there's at least an equal, if not a more important part of uh, being organic is being able to document your work and practices through the field, that you should probably take a look at an opportunity that CFS is offering to get into the MyFarm AgriSecure platform. It is a platform that was developed by farmers. So it's not a piece of software. It's not a buy once and you're on the hook for it. It's a cloud-based managing system of information designed by farmers who are organic farmers to be a better or best way of managing information, first of all, necessary for certification, but then also having applications to help improve management on your farm. It's constantly being updated, improved in order to make it more functional and to make it easier to handle. Um, it is information that you populate in. It is your information. It is your information always. Uh, if you will decide to share information with a group in a blind method, that's also good. It helps everybody learn a little more, but it is your information first and foremost. What makes this system great is that a lot of the opportunity to use this platform, you can do out of season. Right now, you may be operationally busy in the field, but you know certification and the documentation required is coming up if you're not already in the queue to get recertified. By working with this AgriSecure platform, you're populating things out of season and then confirming as you go through and capturing those documents in real time and putting them in a place, that cloud-based managing system, where they're archived and retrievable at any time for certification or for other purposes. But by entering data once, I hopefully will be able to show you different ways how you see that data show up later that makes your life easier as you're going through certification. And especially when it comes time to generating reports. Um, having that information is great, but when you go into certif certification and sit down with your certifier, they're going to want to see things like clean out logs. They're going to want to see rotation plans. They're going to want to see um, your um, uh, last approved substance or your um, land ownership situation. So these are all things you can track with the My Farm platform. So I'm going to go ahead and, and just uh, pull up quickly to the website here. And as a participant with the MyFarm platform, you're able to log in through the website. 
At the bottom of the tab, there's a My Farm platform. By logging in, you're able to uh, view your account. As soon as our internet gets up. And we do have a demo farm set up in uh, My Farm for uh, demonstration purposes. And we're gonna look at this crop here. We could also look if you've got archived, archived information or if you're looking at rotations, we can go further into the future. But as you pull up that basic information page, you're able to see right away the things that are important that have an action alert. You're maybe behind in getting your work orders up to date with cleanouts. You have things that are coming up in a short term and things that are uh, overdue but not critical. You do have some financial information that's generated from all that information you're putting in for certification and also a tab where you can open up and see upcoming activities that are gonna be involved on the farm. One other thing I'd point out is it's a very easy system to navigate, but should you get to a spot where you get confused as to what the best way forward is, we do have individual movies, two minute or three minute videos that will walk you through exactly what you're seeing on the screen and how to do things. So I mentioned earlier about populating things out of season. And one of the things you would populate out of season would be work orders for each of the fields that you're doing operations in. And in this farmer's example, we're gonna take a look at the home place that we have planned on putting organic corn on. It's 110 acres. And this is information we populated out of season. Here's a roster of all the work orders throughout the year. You're able to see things that have happened in the past that you've gone in and confirmed by moving it from a budget item to an actual item. And also you've got um, things coming up in the future. Let me see if I can move the uh, box in here. You also have a layer of actions over on the side. So let's just look at planting corn for an example. We've populated in that we're gonna be planting corn at a planned date. We now have an actual date of planting, which you can go ahead and populate in. Having completed that, you are also able to identify whether cleanouts are necessary for your cleanout log. So maybe you're hundred percent organic and you don't need any other um, cleanout because all your other fields, you can update that work order. And now you've got information for that cleanout log. And also that work order is date um, stamped for that proper date in the field. So the work order system is, is really nice to be able to manage information on the fly through the field. And it's something you can also do with your cell phone. Um, if you are in the field finishing up, I like to go ahead and pull up my account and correct that actual date when I'm doing it. I know as we go through certification, one of the other things that we tend to have struggles with when we're talking with certification is managing that crop from the previous year. So we've got a function called grain tracking that we take a look for the previous year. And we have our crops that we have identified with our work orders from the previous year. We also put in projected yields in the acres and generated the amount of production that's in the field. We have the ability to do transactions of moving crop from different areas. Maybe we're moving organic corn, we're gonna move it from field to storage field to a contract, uh, storage to a contract, or make an adjustment once we settle out bushels. Or you can do a drag and drop, and you can't drag and drop corn into a bean that you've designated, or then you've designated beans, so this tells you you can't do that. But it does help you visually and then track information of what's going on and be able to see at a moment's notice where you're at. Uh, you can go to this bin and find out my 50,000 bushel bin based on what I projected to put in. I've got about 28,800 bushels. Uh, I started harvesting um, in October and hopefully I'm finished up by the end of the year. And then I can also then look at my contracts. Um, you can add contracts or bring contracts in from existing people you're doing business with. Um, you can um, bring that information um, with settlement data when you're um, confirmed to fill those contracts. So let's say we're gonna transact from um, storage to contract and uh, we'd have a load delivery number that we'd use that gets tracked then into the contracts as well. So by bringing that information in out of season, 
by bringing it in a lot of times once, we're able to layer that information in so it's very easy to access and very easy for certification. The number of tabs you have up here can help you identify certain spots. I did wanna show you one other feature and that would be in the uh, document center of being able to add information to your existing fields. So right now we're focused in on planting. Uh, part of obviously what we're gonna be tracking is seed. So in our work orders, we've populated in varieties we expected to use. And we've got a pioneer variety, for example, that we used on a, a couple different farms. With this red dot, we're able to see that we haven't loaded that information in. If you have the uh, invoice, for example, emailed to you and you save that in your computer, you could go ahead and pull that information in terms of an invoice and uh, pull it straight from the file and have it uploaded into this account where you're able to manage that information better and retrieve it then for certification. With seed tags, a lot of what I do is I use my phone and use the link to the website to be able to take pictures of seed tags and upload them directly to this account too. So you're getting away from having binders of paper, you're getting away from loose papers all over the place, you've got it into an archive system and then a system that has things that's retrievable too. So certainly I can't show you everything there is to uh, see in terms of the My Farm functionality. Maybe one last thing is all that information I talked about also has a financial component. And I think it's important as you're running a business to know what your costs are from a production point of view. It makes managing information with your banker, with uh, any other partners essential. And being able to have it all in one place, I think makes it very easy to manage too. Um, we do have other information that's out there uh, that we've put together in terms of things like compliance, where you've got different guidelines, different forms that you can use, templates for bill of lading, for example, or non-GMO or off-farm manure affidavits, cleanouts. Uh, so what I'm saying is we've developed this with the farmer in mind because we're farmers that developed it and made it very easy to access that information. So with that, and, and kind of to review then, we've got this platform that's out there and we're you doing a lot of single entry information to create a plan and certainly having a plan is better than having no plan at all. Um, we're able to put work orders together and manage and delegate things as, as we need. We're able to track all that information throughout the season in real time, moving from actual to budget or being able to grab information about Rain, as I showed you with the harvest tracking information. Uh, you're able to generate those reports for certification with the information you populated in. And once you've populated that information, a number of that information is available then for next year's certification as well. So by single entering it, you're able to feed off of that in the future, making data entry easier and easier as time goes by. And of course, being able to generate those reports and putting yourself in a position to have all that information available make certification go much quicker and easier because you're very much more a professional than someone who's gonna be hunting and packing and working through a shoebox of this or going to their calendar for that or looking at their notebook for other information. Um, one other thing to think about, I think as a baseline for a marketing program, and I think even for your crop insurance, it's important to know that economic and that financial component of what your operation is doing. If you know you're breaking even costs. You can then start to intelligently design and work with someone to design a marketing plan that meets those objectives of cost and then also gives you an opportunity to uh, capture a profit margin where you want to. So with that in mind, I think one of the biggest things I get caught up in is there's so much functionality to the My Farm platform. It's a lot of what? It's a lot of bells. It's a lot of whistles. At the end of the day, though, I think what the My Farm my farm platform does is it gives you more time, it gives you more time to do the things that are more important to you, whether that's managing in the field, whether that's spending more time with the family uh, during the summer months, whether that's reducing the amount of stress uh, the week or two before certification, and you're not going it alone. You've got a team at both CFS and at AgriSecure that can walk you through this platform 
and make sure that you're successful going forward. So with that, I will hand the screen back and uh, introduce uh, Don Clement then. Oh, Don looks like, oh, there you good. Perfect, perfect. Uh, yeah, Paul, I will share my screen here. You guys see that? Yep. Perfect, perfect. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, my name is Don Clemens. Uh, I also work for AgriSecure alongside Pete. Um, and my role here on the team is I work on the organic crop marketing side. Um, so uh, could get into that a little bit later, exactly uh, how we can do that for our customers. But uh, first we'd love to kind of give you a little bit of a, a market overview of what is kind of going on in organics. Um, so this year, 20, you know, since the, the pandemics has started, um, the organic soybean complex has been a very interesting um, market. Um, and a difficult one to navigate at that. So um, typically, you know, in organic soybean prices, we're usually around, you know, uh, between $18.50 and $21 um, is usually a typical price for a bushel of organic soybeans. Um, but since COVID, uh, we've seen a pretty large increase uh, in prices um, due to multiple reasons, but um, all, all basically stemming from uh, India's impact because they actually import about 70% of uh, the product we use here in the soybean complex um, in America. So um, right now what we're seeing is um, India typically exports all that product um, and due to a few different reasons. So shipping costs first. Um, since COVID, those costs have now doubled um, from con shipping containers going from India to the West Coast. Um, the commodity prices for the conventional market have also put a lot of pressure on uh, export margins. Um, it's just not as feasible when domestic products are moving at you know, the $14, $15 marks. Um, then we have had some also government intervention, uh, which has been the real driver for this, um, which first started at the beginning of this year, 2021, um, the NOP. Um, released some new certification policies in India, um, which greatly reduced um, the amount of people certified. Um, also, since then, the anti there's been an anti-dumping petition um, put on through the Organic Soybean Processors Association, um, and that has really put a gridlock. So um, right now, uh, end users in, a, in domestically here in the U.S. Um, know their supply is going to be very, very tight. Um, so we've seen a huge increase in the price um, of organic soybeans. Um, so you can see right here, um, the green is, is organic. And this chart is only um, in a month old here. And uh, this, this price of $22, which is, which is high, has skyrocketed. And we're seeing bushels trading in Nebraska and Iowa for old crop um, north of $20, $28. And in terms of new crop, we're seeing um, up to $25 offers um, already. Um, so it has just been a very interesting year. And a reason why you need to have a marketing plan and, and adjust you know, throughout the year. Um, you know, typically, a lot of growers um, tend to market a lot of their beans early, um, you know, typically sometimes even through production contracts. Um, but in a year like this, you know, uh, we saw this kind of coming, and for our customers now, we have, you know, really halted bean sales. Um, and you know, typically, you know, we we saw those twenty one, twenty two dollars, and you know, it was hard not not to uh, bite. But at the same regard, um, we knew that this India situation was getting more serious, and, and time was still on our side. So um, that has started; those prices are starting to come to fruition. And you know, going forward. Um, it is, you know, something we got to be paying very close attention to um, going forward. So um, switching over to, to the corn story, uh, something, you know, the commodity, um, a bit more, a bit more production uh, here domestically. Um, but there, there is, a, you know, in both the soybean market and the corn market, um, what we tend to see is um, the imports playing a huge factor in how our 
domestic prices end up turning out. Um, so, you know, currently what we're seeing on the corn side is imports have been really reduced because of the conventional price, similar to what I was mentioning earlier on the soybeans. Um, you know, pro, uh, exporters in Eastern Europe, you know, especially at some points this year, I mean, I know there's been a, a dip in the conventional prices here the last week and a half, but, at, you know, $2, two dollars um, of difference between these prices, um, it's noticeably uh, impacted the market. Um, so that has really driven prices higher. Um, and looking at the domestic story, um, we've had continued um, demand throughout this year. COVID um, really didn't put too much of a hamper in the demand side. Uh, feed, feed has been a huge factor, especially in the poultry market. Um, and that has also helped stem um, this, this upper momentum we've seen in the last uh, five or six months in the organic corn prices. Um, a lot of our customers, um, you know, especially coming over to organic from conventional, um, you know, are, are accustomed to, you know, using a futures market um, and getting a lot of that transparent information uh, from multiple sources, whether it be farm radio, whether it be, um, you know, their local, um, you know, co-op. But in the organic price, you know, it, it is a free market. You know, there's no futures. You know, the price of what someone's willing to pay for it is ultimately how um, it works. And so how that price is discovered is um, sometimes unrealized. So just want to go through that, that with you guys. And so the end user, as you quite imagine, um, in this physical type of market is ultimately the one who's going to be um, pricing these bushels and, and determining that price. But how they determine that um, is like I was saying earlier, through imports and also domestically. Um, so you take a look at the domestic side, um, there's, you know, a, a group of middlemen, you know, of buyers and brokers um, that you consolidate the grain, um, buy it at an on-farm level. Um, and they typically get contracts and kind of feel the price of what is going on in the end user level. And that's how they determine what they're willing to buy prices for. Um, looking over to the, the export side, um, they, what they look for is what is the margin and how much money can I make selling organic corn compared to selling it in the domestic market or somewhere else? Um, and so those two parties kind of coming together is ultimately how we, we discover that price. And, you know, this year we have tightness on the export side, um, which has driven it. Um, last year we had, you know, huge stocks um, domestically. So that's what drove it, it down. So, you know, it's, it's always a balancing act. Um, looking at the organic prices of, of corn, um, you know, they have been trending up, but not at the same rates um, that we were seeing uh, com or organic, I mean, conventional corn. Um, and now we've definitely dipped here a bit in the conventional price, um, you know, over a dollar in the last week. But, you know, still compared to traditionally, historically, you know, we can see these gaps. Um, here, you know, typically we have about a $4 variance between conventional and organic. Um, so that spread is still tight and, you know, that should continue to possibly disincentivize imports going forward. So kind of in, in summary here, um, what we're looking at price-wise um, with the corn and bean markets um, as you plan ahead for, um, you know, old crop and possibly new crop as well. Um, you know, old crop prices um, looking at, you know, into July for corn have gotten up to $9. Uh, 25 plus, you know, I've, like I said, I'm hearing a bushels trading for possibly even $28, $29. Um, looking ahead at new crop and peens, it's already um, 23, three bucks and, and sometimes even higher. So really uh, good numbers. Um, but at the same time, there's definitely some, some price risk there. Um, and that's why we have to plan ahead. And that's why having an organic marketing plan and marketer like myself, if, if you go into organics, um, I think is really beneficial um, because, you know, like we were talking earlier on that ROI, um, you know, it really makes, you know, this market is not very transparent. Um, so looking at just beans, for instance, um, let's just say you have seven loads of beans, a thousand loads of bushel, I mean, a thousand bushels a load. Um, right now, if you would have contracted um, all your bushels um, without really knowing 
the history of this market and how it's moving and this Indian information, let's say you, you thought you got a great price at $21, you know, that's historically a high. Um, well, you could, you could have left, you know, a, you know, you could have left a, a thousand, you know, $7 off the table there possibly. Um, and that's $7,000 a load there. Um, so it can add up uh, pretty quick um, on that. So ultimately, um, you know, this market is very, is not very transparent. And that's what we're here to do is bring that transparency. Um, but then also, you know, bring you to, to the marketplace. Um, it is kind of hard as you're entering the um, industry to, you know, know where your options are and where you can go with it. So that's something we help bridge as well. Um, and ultimately, um, that bringing all that transparency, bring you to the marketplace, um, we think over a year's time um, definitely can help uh, benefit you and, and be a great return on investment. Um, so I'll uh, end it a little early here. And uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, I'd be more than happy to answer them. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Don. Uh, so it looks like we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, if anyone's interested in having any questions answered, uh, there's a Q&A tab on the bottom of your screen. So uh, just click that, type in your answer, and we can read it out loud, and uh, hopefully we can find some answers for you. Um, in the meantime, uh, anything that you guys wanted to bring up? I was going to say, just one thing that I see going on right now is everybody's uh, busy putting things in the field making sure that those inputs that they're using, whether it's um, a traditional product or a new product on your farm, that it does have uh, approval with your certification body and or does have that current commerce certificate. Uh, there's a lot of products that are out there, a lot of salesmen that are bringing trial size products to try this or try that, or things that uh, are all natural or things that are um, um, supposedly uh, organic but not certified. It's certainly time to be proactive. And before you go to the field, make sure those are approved products. All right. Um, so uh, got a couple of questions here. Um, uh, James, what's your opinion of SAP testing over tissue testing? Oh, James, you're still muted. Can you hear me now, Ron? Yep. Good. Um, it depends on the plant. Uh, tissue testing is more accurate for um, whether it be corn or soybeans. Sap is more accurate when you're dealing with things. Um, potatoes, it, it's more crop specific, I guess would be my answer on that one. And then even the stage of the crop. OK. Um uh, so Pete, this one's uh, headed out your way. How do you get the AgriSecure uh, My Farm? Well, through CFS. Um, yeah, we can get together with you on a one-to-one -one basis and um, sit down with our CFS representative and uh, bring that package to you. We do have two different uh, levels of support. Uh, for most people who are in organic, it's the access to the platform and that's bracketed out by acres. Um, so it, it does depend on the amount of acres. Um, you know, if you're in that 500 acres or less, it's gonna be about uh, $2,500. And then it's bracketed up from there. The, the one thing I would say though, is when we talk about price, um, it's hard to understand where the price point is until you see the value of everything that we're able to do. So the performance part of things is something that I don't think I'm able to get across much in a presentation unless you're in an operation that um, is just looking for that best new way out there. Um, we can go ahead and, and demonstrate the value. And I think where we're at as a company, we see a lot of people that are willing to pay for a lot more product support once they see what we can do. Uh, but I think for guys that are established organic, um, they're just gonna need the information. And I guess I'd consider it help level plus or help desk level plus uh, service and support. And like I mentioned, there's a lot of information um, on the website and then those boxes to help walk you through with a video or with other uh, documents um, and then sitting down and helping you populate in a system. Uh, that's a big part of it. So 
that's the biggest thing. Get together with Ron and, and the people at CFS. We'll set up a time and then uh, show you the value one on one. All right, fantastic. Oh, James, you have something to add? Uh, actually, I actually had a, a question for Don there at the end of his presentation. Uh, wheat price, uh, just given the drought that we're having in the Western states here and the Western Midwest, um, do you see much volatility in that market as we go into fall here? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, so um, in terms of organic wheat, um, the, there's kind of two factors. Um, you know, there is the, the milling market and then there's the feed market. Um, and so, yes, our northern wheats are typically, you know, where we see most of, of the milling quality stuff. Um, and so, especially in, you know, the Dakotas, um, you know, in other parts of the West, Montana, um, we're seeing, you know, the, the drought kick in. Um, and, you know, at the moment, um, it has, I know, lifted, lifted prices. Um, you know, we've seen it in the conventional wheat sphere a little bit. Um, but at the same time, uh, we did see some rains here and that dropped conventional wheat um, here the last week or so. Um, but um, going ahead to organics, um, yes, it, it's definitely going to be impacting the prices. Um, but in, in terms of, uh, of price, there's going to be a dramatic difference. So, you know, looking at milling quality, you know, um, hard red winter or hard red spring, um, you're probably looking at, you know, uh, around... $11, $12 um, at the mill. And this year, potentially somewhat more elevated, especially um, with the drought conditions. Um, then looking at feed wheat, uh, unfortunately, um, it goes really directly correlates with corn um, as an input, you know, as a transplant uh, for corn on a feed ration. So what you're looking like there is typically about a dollar fifty um, to a dollar below where the corn price is. Um, so you know, just even a week and a half ago, um, you know, there's been little, very little interest this time of year in feed wheat uh, as the new crops coming in, and you know, feed wheat was probably trading exact, about with, with conventional. Um, you know, with that rally almost hitting seven fifty uh, on the conventional side. Um, so we're um, in the wheat market, um, there's definitely some upside. Um, and especially, you know, if you can consider grow, consistently grow milling quality stuff, um, you know, 12 to 13% to protein, um, you know, you're looking at, um, you know, elevated prices. Unfortunately, if you're kind of in the wheat and the, uh, the feed side, um, it can vary. Um, and then lastly, you know, the one part about organic wheat is, it's a very good third crop. Um, so, you know, in Iowa, Nebraska, where typically eventually you don't see many wheat acres grown, um, you do see uh, more organic wheat acres. Um, so, you know, it depends on the year, but if they can make protein, all of a sudden those milling markets can get considerably flooded and you see a drastic decrease in price. Um, don't probably see that happening this year, but, um, you know, time will tell. All right, thank you. Uh, James, I got another one for you. Uh, when soil sampling, do you spend the extra money for grid sampling or go the traditional way? Or is it based on field size? Um, I would say it'd be good to look at all those factors. Grid sampling, the real value of grid sampling comes in doing it at least once initially to see if I have variation in my field and how extensive that variation is. Once you have done grid sampling once, let's say you're doing it on an 80 or 100 acre field or even, even a 40. Uh, normally what you can do is split that field into let's say two or possibly three zones. You typically don't have to come back and grid sample on five acre grids or two and a half acre grids. Again, ideally what you do is you split that field into zones, management zones, and then sample in those, those areas. So in a 40, you might have 15 acres and 25 acres in each of those zones and then just pull a comp uh, um, composite sample out of those areas and that will be representative of that field. Zone sampling is probably your most cost effective way to sample when you look at your return on investment. James, I'd like to throw one thing in there too. If you're going to go through with the uh, zone or the uh, grid sampling, I think it's important also to pull a soil map and uh, understand and identify those soil masses where you're trying to pull samples from. 
Uh, there's a lot of information of uh, water holding capacity and um, nutrient availability and, and yield productivity that's possible with varying soil types. So I always like to, a combination of things with zone or using uh, soil uh, maps to decide where to take samples or to use a grid. But all that information together helps get more workable data on how to go forward and manage it. It, zone development, you want to spend the time pulling as much information as possible before you set those zones. The better you do that on that initial planning, the better you're going to be able to have a representative part of the field that you're going to be sampling on a regular basis. All right. Well, I think we've answered pretty much every question here. Um, I guess uh, we've got about three minutes left, but I think we're good to call her good here. Uh, so I want to thank all of our panelists here for uh, coming in and saying hi, and uh, thank you for all for joining us. Uh, we I would like to make take a quick time to uh, plug our field day uh, coming up second or third week of August. Haven't decided yet. We're trying to figure out when it will be most beneficial for farmers to be able to take some time out of their day and enjoy a nice Saturday with us. So uh, please uh, keep a lookout for that and uh, call us with any additional questions. Uh, my phone number is 612-309. 7522. Thank you very much. And you guys all have a wonderful, uh, wonderful spring and summer. Thank you. Be Bye. safe. Bye. Bye. Bye.